Aloha, uh, I'm Dr. Catherine Takeda Wong. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today with Dr. Lauren Anderson. Um, she is a part of our practice and feel, I feel very, very blessed to be able to work with her. Um, she's an amazing doctor and I've, I've known her for many years and, and just feel really blessed to have her. Um, our mission at our office is to heal the sick, not just to give them pills to take for the rest of their lives. Uh, as naturopathic doctors, we can write prescriptions for drugs, but we would rather write them for herbs and healing foods. Um, and as Chinese medicine experts, we can employ a whole different approach to health that complements our Western system. And as a healer, our mission really is to educate and empower as many people as we can about how to become healthier and happier. Healthy people, happy world, right? So today, yes. um, the topic is skin conditions. We will be talking about how the naturopathic medicine approach is different from the conventional approach. Um, and we're gonna be talking about a few specific conditions. They will include eczema, acne, chronic fungal skin rashes, and lupus. Uh, my, my specialty is the medical treatment of autism, ADHD, and other special needs. And I also treat some of the toughest adult conditions. Um, my associate, Dr. Lauren Anderson, ND, joined our practice a year and a half ago. She has the training and expertise to treat very tough skin conditions, as well as hormone imbalances, digestive issues, allergies, and women's health, just to name a few. And she has expertise in many other areas. Um, but these are some of her main specialties. Now, because natural medicine is a specialty unto itself, we believe it's important for people to understand how it would work for their condition. So we don't take new patients without a free phone consultation. The contact information is on our Facebook page. We're going to begin by outlining how naturopathic medicine approaches skin conditions differently than conventional medicine approaches. Uh, but first, just a quick word to encourage you to visit the online store that I founded it lets you make a difference for children with special needs with every purchase. All of the products are tested for purity by independent labs. There is a 20% discount and 100% of the store's proceeds goes towards helping special needs families with the cost of their child's treatment. The store is at drtaketawong.com. That's drtaketawong.com. So let's get started. Uh, so, Dr. Anderson, again, very pleased and blessed to have you here with us today. Uh, so, in your view, if you could talk just generally, how, how does naturopathic medicine differ from conventional medicine when it comes to skin conditions? Sure, that's a great question. And I would like to say back that I feel the same. <laughs> just as lucky to be part of such a wonderful team. So I think the easiest way to explain the difference in how we approach skin conditions versus the Western approach is that the Western approach is very much on, on the surface. You know, they're gonna be looking to give you creams, ointments to put on your skin condition. And some of them are super effective, right? Like, like steroids, they are very effective, but you know, they come with a whole host of other concerning side effects, right? So as natural doctors, we're always seeking, whether it's skin conditions or anything else, to figure out what is at the root cause, what's driving this. So instead of suppressing those symptoms, we want to heal, you know, the body um, of that, that root cause symptoms that, that's creating. So the skin, probably more than anything else, right, gives us a window into what's going on inside the body. And in a few organs, especially, right? Our liver, our gut health, you know, and then I also, whenever it comes to skin, I also think about diet, like, mm -hmm. and it could be nutrient deficiencies on one end, right? Someone's not getting enough essential fatty acids or they're not getting enough protein in their diet, or it could be on the other end where they're eating too much of the unhealthy inflammatory stuff and it's really showing up, mm -hmm. you know, on their skin. Okay. So. So yeah, I mean, I think getting to the root cause of, of what's driving this condition is what helps us to really treat skin stuff effectively. Yeah, yeah. 
And we'll get into a few different things where I think we really see the, the differences, right? Because we've had, I know we both had a lot of patients that have come to us with skin conditions and we, you know, we're gonna talk about eczema next. And it's really common that we see patients where they go to their doctor and okay, they have eczema or whatever it is, here's a steroid cream, right? And so a lot of patients have said, okay, yeah, I put the steroid cream on, it gets better or goes away, but then as soon as I stop the steroid cream, then it just comes right back. And a lot of times it comes back even worse than it was initially because what is a steroid cream doing? The steroid cream is suppressing the inflammation, but it's not addressing the underlying cause, right, of why is the inflammation there in the first place? Why is the skin reacting in this way? And so it suppresses it and then you know that it maybe makes it go away but then as soon as you stop it because the underlying root is root of the issue is not addressed as soon as you stop it boom that the, you know that inflammation just swells right. you know just it just comes back even more and oftentimes the rashes are even worse than before and people just get really frustrated because they're like you know mm. they just keep giving me stronger and stronger creams or they just give me um, they start giving oral medicines that suppress the immune system more and more and more. And then they come with all these side effects. They can be more likely to get sick and yeah. all yes. kinds of issues, right? Those are the oral medications that are trying to suppress the immune system has a lot of side effects yeah. and, um, you know, which are really not fun, right? right? So let's talk about in terms of eczema specifically, how we treat eczema differently than in the conventional approach so can you share a little bit about yeah, that? yeah i think the main approach in western medicine like dr chiquetta wong said is topical you know it's always going to typically start with topical steroids and maybe maybe some diet changes but oftentimes i if it's if it's the first interaction with in eczema we, we, we mostly treat in pediatric kid in kiddos right but we do treat it in adults too but most commonly you know they'll come and maybe have made no diet changes to see if it'll make an effect on there. So that is typically always where I start, right? We wanna investigate what is the person eating in their diet that's causing their body to have a reaction. Cause eczema is really essentially um, an autoimmune in its pathophysiology, you know, the process of it. So we want to figure out what are the things that, that the person's doing in their diet, in their environment, and in their day-to-day -day life, right? Like stress, stress is another huge thing right, that I think yeah. it, overlooked in in Western medicine as being a trigger for I mean it's one of the biggest triggers for autoimmune and auto one of the most common symptoms of all autoimmune conditions right is joint pain and skin conditions or skin rashes mm -hmm. you know so it's it's all essentially connected but circling back to eczema you know we need to balance the immune system and address the inflammation mm -hmm. The, the steroids, if they, they they are effective, like we said, but because of the side effects, you cannot. Like most topical steroids, many of them, you can't take for longer than two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you get this relief for two weeks and then the, then the patient goes off the cream and like you said, it, it comes back worse. And then we call that withdrawal. You know, the withdrawal, the rebound symptom mm -hmm. can happen. Yeah. So what we you know and there are rare cases and i because i don't want to be completely down on on pharmaceuticals right because there are rare cases where we may need to use them in the short term right to get somebody some relief so that we can work on the underlying causes yeah. but if we're mm -hmm. always going to be working on those underlying causes so right. we're going to be checking in on diet working on stress and sleep and then addressing inflammation mm -hmm. and typically you know i i'm things i'm always going to prescribe for eczema always going to look be looking at vitamin D at your essential fatty acids right the, another thing too I think for all skin conditions that gets looked over is just hydration mm -hmm. in general yeah right because so yeah. many eczema conditions are really dry in mm -hmm. nature yeah you know, so if you're not meeting those basic things all the most fancy protocols aren't going to you know <laughs> right yeah so a big thing in eczema then is is addressing whatever is happening in the body that caused that immune dysregulation mm -hmm. you know yeah. in the first place and so a lot of times that circles back to the gut mm -hmm. and the food allergies and leaky gut are included in there and then also oftentimes you're gonna find that that patient has some imbalances in their microbiome mm -hmm. right the the balance of all the healthy and unhealthy bacteria maybe it was because they had 
um, courses of antibiotics as a child, you know, and, and, and mom didn't know to give them probiotics afterwards, right? So so I, I say, you know, that that's a, a pretty common approach that, yeah. you know, I take for eczema. Is there anything else that, that you commonly use that... Well, I mean, I, I was going to say really quick for the viewers. I mean, not every not everyone may know what the microbiome is. So, when, oh, just right. to clarify, like the microbiome yeah. is, is we're talking about like the normal gut bacteria in the yeah. gut, and if there's imbalances, if there's like too much bad bacteria or not enough of the good bacteria or too much yeast yep. or other kinds of problematic things, then there's an imbalance, and it's what's going on in the gut, like the the bacteria, good and bad, is what's called the microbiome. So just yeah. an explanatory kind of thing. I would say also yeah. with eczema that I've, I've also seen sometimes where people might be reacting to topical kind of things that they might be using on yes. their face or you know other yeah. kinds of things. Like some people, I've seen some cases of eczema resolve where it wasn't necessarily a dietary thing, but some of the products that they were using, like sodium lauryl sulfate, which is a common, even in the, the hypoallergenic clean ones, sometimes it will still have sodium lauryl sulfate. So, you know, we've, I know we've both seen patients that have reacted to that, or sometimes it's other ingredients that's in topical things um, yeah. that could be you know, triggering or, you know, contributing to And I've had cases on. too where allergy, the, the common food allergies and environmental allergies, right, are always gonna typically have been tested or known mm -hmm. at that point. But what I have noticed with some of my more challenging cases of eczema where they had a, an allergy that was less common, right? Mm -hmm. Like a mm -hmm. allergy to something like nickel right. or formaldehyde, yeah. you know, and it's something that's in just a bunch of random things. So there's right. not a lot of consistency. Yeah. But, yeah. but allergies are, are and, and sen food sensitivities are definitely often at play mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to go on to the next condition. Um, but you can you talk about all this? So I know. Long. Yeah, I know. There's so many different things. So this is just, you know, I want to say is not meant to be a seminar. I mean, you could talk for hours on eczema alone, but it's just yeah. meant to be a really brief introduction and primer to how naturopathic medicine will differ than conventional medicine treating yes. some of the common skin conditions. So can you tell yes. us a little bit about acne in terms of, you know, how you approach acne yeah. specifically? Oh. It, it's going to be a similar approach, but oftentimes it's different, uh, a different focus, right? So acne patients will oftentimes have food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. They will find that certain foods, it's more of like a trigger, mm -hmm. right? So things like sugar, conventional dairy, chocolate for some people, you know, there's a, there, there definitely is a connection there like there is with eczema. But I would say the big differentiator Whereas with eczema, I'd say we've got inflammation. With acne, we've got right a lot of times a hormone imbalance, right. and that's yeah. where, mm -hmm. and we still it, that circles back to the liver again, right? Mm -hmm. So our liver is responsible for metabolizing our hormones, and oftentimes if our liver is overwhelmed just from living in the world, you know, with all the toxins in our air, food, water, um, that can sort of. Uh, contribute to overwhelm in the liver and and issues with hormone imbalance mm -hmm. so oftentimes hormone imbalance will be a, a lead driver of acne where we need to mm -hmm. address that primarily when when patients have what we call as androgen excess mm -hmm. um, and those androgens which are you know will cause patients to um overdevelop sebum right and that sebum clogs their pores and then the other thing too with, with acne that's unique compared to eczema is, is oftentimes there's right an, an infection. Mm -hmm. There's bacterial infection. And the thing with this skin stuff that people don't think about, there's not just infection here. There's often infection in the gut tube too, or even potentially systemically. Yeah. Right? That's mm -hmm. what is is the key to really healing these conditions. Right. Is dealing with that, figuring out what's happening, not just on the surface, but in the body and then addressing that. Right. Uh, with acne too, I think uh, some dosing with certain nutrients like vitamin A and things, and that's something you don't ever want to, you know, high dose vitamin A is something that can potentially be um, toxic. You, Yes, you want to seek you want to seek professional advice from someone who's familiar with di you know, with uh, prescribing high dose vitamin A for acne if you are right. going to use yeah, that. Definitely, you know, and that's that's basically what pharmaceuticals are all 
boil down to. But again, it's always all topical stuff. And if it is internal, there's some, you know, major, you know, major side effects there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. Uh, And then I think also in terms of acne, um, I mean, it's, it's also, I mean, you talked about some of the basic kind of things, hydration and, um, you know, things like that. Uh, But then it's, it's also, um, you mentioned like the liver metabolizing or metabolizing basically means like breaking down bones and things like that. And um, if, you know, like, so that there's that piece and then you mentioned the, the infection piece, right? Mm-hmm. So in conventional medicine, a lot of dermatologists will give oral antibiotics for the bacterial infection that is persistent on the skin. And I've seen yep. some patients that they come in and they've been on antibiotics, oral antibiotics for like months and months mm-hmm. and months, you know, and, um, and, and it gets rid of their acne, right? Um, because you're killing the bacteria, but people often don't realize that that can have serious repercussions for their health later on down the line. Um, So can you talk a little bit about some of the issues with, you know, just giving oral antibiotics continuously for long periods of time to treat acne? Absolutely. So antibiotics are real effective. They do their job very well. And the thing that they don't do is they don't discriminate in the microbiome between our healthy what we call our healthy and our unhealthy bacteria they just sort of wipe out you know without a preference and when your when your gut tube or your you know your gut tube is basically goes from your mouth to the other end and i always tell people it's kind of like a garden hose right like continuous and so inside that gut tube the healthy bacteria has so many important jobs and it's, it's one of its most important jobs is it sort of takes space up uh, and helps to prevent the bad bugs, things like can, you know, candida, things like bad bacteria like staph and strep and E. coli from, from overgrowing. So what happens is when you wipe out that microbiome, you allow for these, it's a good opportunity for these unsavory <laughs> characters to sort of, right? Yeah. <laughs> Proliferate. Mm-hmm. And then that just, the gut is our the cornerstone keystone for our for our immune system right for educating our immune system on what's coming in the body um helping our immune system prepare so the gut link the microbiome and gut link back to skin stuff is so 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 strong right and that goes for not just acne but autoimmune and everything else right so taking antibiotics for long periods of time, we will often see patients develop allergies, um, eczema, asthma, right, as children. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in older folks, it's maybe gonna turn out like like an autoimmune condition or, you know, if if this goes on over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, so while, I mean, we're not opposed to the use of antibiotics in, dire situations or when it's really right. needed. I mean, the continuous indiscriminate use of antibi- oral antibiotics over and over for long periods of time is really problematic in it. And it's, it's very concerning because I, you know, I know that both of us have seen patients where they've come in where their doctor has prescribed them oral antibiotics and the, the, the prescription for acne is just, oh, just stay on these antibiotics. Like, forever, you know, until you're no longer a teenager and the, the acne goes away on its own, which is not right. a good, which is not a good idea because it leads to a well, lot and the of resistance is the other problems. Issue. Yeah. It leads to a lot of problems down the line. So yeah, with antibiotic resistance, right. Then of course the bacteria can start to become resistant to the antibiotics. And then if you have a severe life threatening infection, like acne is typically very rarely ever life threatening, you know, Right, um, right. You know, but if you have a severe life-threatening infection, then you need to take antibiotics, and then those that, microbes in your in your body are already resistant to them. That and that infection can turn into a very severe life-threatening infection, and then you don't have antibiotics. They're going to be able to to kill those bacteria, right? So that's another major problem with just giving oral antibiotics for long periods of time. Um, yeah. Let's move on now to chronic fungal skin infections. Um, because these can definitely be a bigger problem for people living in the tropics, like in Hawaii, 
um, where it's, you, you know, year round warmth. warmth and moisture because <laughs> fungus and yeast love, love, they love warmth and they love moisture. And that's, you know, Hawaii is the perfect environment for that. Um, so let's consider how natural medicine looks in that condition. Could you talk a little bit about how um, natural medicine treats fun chronic fungal skin infections versus in conventional medicine? Yeah. I would say one of the biggest differentiators is we're going to use herbs mostly, you know, versus antifungals. Although once in a while we will use an antifungal if it's a if it's a a more severe case. And like I mentioned earlier, you may use a pharmaceutical in the beginning, right, for a short period of time, like two weeks to four weeks, to sort of get things under control and then carry on with your herbs. But like we said with the antibiotics, you when you're going to use a pharmaceutical, there always needs to be a real good reason. And you have, like, if we're going to use an antibiotic, it's ideal always if you're going to do the culture and sensitivity, right? You figure out what bug it is you're treating so that you're using an antibiotic that you know is going to be effective against it. But back to the antifungals, I think the importance with chronic fungal infections and, and getting sugar and refined carbohydrates out of your diet, you know, that's probably one of the biggest challenges for people, yeah. you know? And, and that's probably where we work the most with patients is helping them because the that sugar and, and carbohydrate, that's what the bugs love. It's fuel for them, right? So if you combine that hot, hot, humid, moist weather with sugar on the inside, they're just like happy as can be, yeah. right? <laughs> so it starts with eliminating their fuel source, you know, and then of course, I, I would say when compared to some of the other skin conditions, chronic fungal infections, they need to be treated for typically a long period of time because they, they very easily become systemic in the body. They're not just on the surface of your skin. They're in your gut tube, you know, and, and, and fungal infections sort of have a way of seeding in the tissues a little different than the other microbes, would you say? Yeah, I think so. I think it it's much more. to like get in there. Yeah. It's like they grow roots almost or something, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think that's one of the, the main, and then using the the antifungal herbs versus, you know, an antifungal pharmaceutical and nutrients as well. You know, there's some great things for like grapefruit seed extract. And um, another major difference, I think, in how we approach skin stuff, and, and this touches all the things we've talked about, but fungal and especially is we can develop these things inside our body called biofilms, mm -hmm. where the bugs hide inside this. It's like a protein coating they're very smart right so this way when we give the antifungals or we give the antibacterials they're protected they're not affected so in, in naturopathic medicine you know we we have begun to use these by what we call biofilm disruptors right to help treat patients who have these serious chronic infections mm -hmm. yeah and those are typically enzymes and other kinds of things that will break up that biofilm. I tell people it's like a slime layer, you know, and if you yeah, think about like, exactly right, you like. know, like when you have food that starts to go bad, then it starts to get slimy, right? And that's because the, the bacteria are then growing and they're, they're creating this slime layer over them to protect them from things that could kill them. And that's why your food starts to get slimy when it starts to go bad is from biofilms, you know? So um, yeah, so giving these biofilm breakers or disruptors, you know, are things that will break up that that slime layer over them. And then after that, we give things that will help to kill them more effectively. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. Um, well, and one thing I haven't mentioned yet for anything, but I will say quickly is, you know, of course, probiotics. But the thing with probiotics is that's a complicated conversation, um, mainly because if you have bacterial overgrowth in your gut, bad bacteria if you are feeding if you're trying to promote healthy bacteria in your gut and you're taking foods and probiotics to do that you could also be potentially feeding the bad bacteria mm -hmm. you know in a sense which is why a lot of we get i don't know about you but i get so many patients that come in and they're doing these things they're trying their skin for their gut um, but it's actually making their symptoms worse oh, yeah. you know with which yeah. is where getting right yeah like if they realize they have bacterial overgrowth and they're taking a bunch of prebiotics they're yeah. actually you know fueling the bad bacteria too mm -hmm. yeah and there's many different kinds of probiotics and we're not going to go into that you know that's not a discussion for today <laughs> but i think that's where you know having experts is really helpful because 
you know, the average person doesn't really know about all the different types of probiotics, what is the best species and the best strain for this condition, right. what's the best dose, and, you know, it's not just like all just one generic thing. There are many, many different types right. of probiotics and many different types that are helpful for different conditions, and I think that's where that, that expertise is so helpful. Um, and uh, so, you know, I do find that, uh, just as a reminder for our viewers, you know, I do find that people uh, do call and talk with me after viewing a video or two or visiting our website, and some do become patients. Uh, so for our viewers, if you have a health condition that you want to talk with us about, please go ahead and schedule a no-charge phone consultation. All the contact information is on our Facebook page because we want to make sure that when we work with people as patients that it's a good fit and that we can come up with a plan to see how we can help you the most. Uh, and I think we have just enough time to uh, let people know how we approach treatment for autoimmune rashes like yes. lupus and discoid lupus. Uh, um, so first, could you briefly explain the difference between systemic lupus and discoid lupus? So discoid lupus, they're both autoimmune conditions, right? But the discoid lupus is sort of a subset where it's just primarily affecting the skin. It's not going to be systemic lupus means that this autoimmune condition is going to be affecting multiple different organ systems in your body, not just your skin, but potentially, right, your kidneys, your heart. When we say systemic, we mean it's affecting the whole body yeah. versus being uh, localized to a certain organ system. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, for lupus and discoid lupus, can you talk a little bit about how we approach that with naturopathic medicine and treating that? Yeah, I think lupus has a whole nother right layer to it. Although it's autoimmune like eczema was, the lupus patient is going to have a little bit different of an approach as far as like triggers and things like that, right? Like many people with lupus, and this is something that Western medicine does as well. But again, it's always gonna come down to addressing those root causes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's really what it always comes back down to. And with autoimmune, you know, addressing the gut, addressing the inflammation. So with, with lupus, I think in the, the skin rashes with lupus, it is most linked to inflammation mm -hmm. and what I find stress. Mm -hmm. So many patients with autoimmune like lupus, they get flares of their condition right mm -hmm. when they're being stressed so stress and trauma is going to be sort of an ongoing thing that we're going to address and whatever that looks like for that patient you know our approach is going to vary mm -hmm. but with the inflammation i do find that with something like lupus you need especially with a systemic lupus condition where it's a, potentially affecting your organ systems what you you want to really work on sort of calming down that fire of inflammation and stopping the body cells um mm -hmm. and that that is where addressing and finding out what's triggering these processes in the body right and so looking at things like heavy metals like underlying co-infections um like gut health again of course liver health and all that <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it's it, it essentially becomes a little bit more complicated of a version of what we've been talking about all along mm -hmm. when it comes to something like especially systemic lupus. Mm -hmm. um, topically, I think I have had a lot of success with things like CBD, mm -hmm. um, either topically or internally, you know, things like curcumin. Um, and then we often, I have actually been having a lot of success too with skin conditions related to autoimmune, you know, using the low dose naltrexone, mm -hmm. which actually is a pharmaceutical <laughs> that is used off label um, for many different autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and actually one of our um, staff put in the notes and put in a question, do you think that the standard uh, American diet, so this is kind of moving away from lupus, but asking, do you think that the standard American diet has degraded people's bodies so much that natural and conventional treatment for fungal skin and conditions have a hard time working? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that that it's that the standard American diet has degraded the body so much. It's more that 
the the standard American diet fuels those those fungal conditions. So it's really hard to battle them over time when you're it, it would be like I always explain it to people. It's like you've got imagine you've got a fire going on inside your body. Mm-hmm. And every time you eat sugar, it's like throwing gasoline on that mm-hmm. fire. Yeah. And here we are, we're trying to come in and fight this fire, whether it's with natural stuff or Western stuff. And sometimes the fire is just too right. If you keep on putting fuel on the fire. So that's why that that piece of the approach is so key in, yeah. in having success mm-hmm. and treating it. Yeah. And not have a person end up on medication after medication. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I trust our discussion for our viewers has, about skin conditions has been useful for you. You can learn more about our practice at our website at drtaketawong.com. Uh, also, please remember to visit our online supplement store, which is on our website. Our prices are very competitive, and all the proceeds go to helping children with special needs with their medical treatment. Um, a link is in the post with this video and you're also welcome to talk with me personally about any health concerns that you may have so that you too can feel empowered with your health that's what we really want is we want to empower people yeah. and I think that's part of why it's so rewarding you know to do what we do um, all the contact information is on our Facebook page mahalo for being with us and we look forward uh, to being with you or I'll be uh, you know and again in another two weeks uh, aloha Aloha.